but definitely something that started small again here, the lean approach, just a very small target, small test, test it on 50 people and then expand it. Business development is the career up for discussion on today's podcast. Our guest today develops businesses by focusing on disruptive projects, strategic innovation and social impact. She has recently been awarded the 30 under 30 award by the International News Media Association as part of their Young Professionals Initiative. She's also been named as one of the future leaders by Digiday in 2016. Before joining business development, she was a startup founder and entrepreneur. She currently works as a business development manager at Financial Times. She's a source of innovation and energy throughout the media business and uncovers new opportunities for Financial Times to be successful. It is my pleasure to introduce Virginia Stagney on today's podcast and discuss with her the journey of her job. You are listening to The Career Show, a podcast that helps you find the right career and inspires you to follow your passion. My name is Trishan Kansrajani and I'm a student seeking answers to career-based questions that we all have. I'm here to sit down with career specialists and talk to them about the lessons learned during the journey of their career. Hi everyone. Hi Trishan. Thank you so much for having me. Very nice to see you again. Hi. So glad to have you on the show. So I remember you mentioning to me about your passion for news and media. You have had this passion since childhood. However, when one thinks about choosing news and media as their career, they mainly think about journalism and reporting stuff. How did you come across the role of a business developer at the industry of your choice? This is news and media. Definitely, I think like how we see uh, the news organizations and generally the media space is like being a media actor most of the time means being a journalist, being a reporter, being a, a video maker, or, you know, for, as, as you in this case, right, uh, being a moderator of a podcast and even, you know, kind of a journalist. However, uh, the media world, as any other organization, has so many other departments and parts that are basically componing the business as it is and um, I've always been kind of interested in uh, the business models and how um, models uh, that shape not just the commercial outlook of a company but as generally like you know how you can innovate through new ways of interacting with uh, tech companies as well as uh, with uh, other actors in uh, the business ecosystem at is more general, you know, overview. Um, and business development, this is what it means at the FT, is not about sales, but is about uh, generally developing innovative models. What I'm thinking here is that you can be an innovator, not just in the news organizations, of course, not just through uh, being a content side mind, but looking at opportunities for developing the business side. So making journalism, making news organizations sustainable is fundamental for the news institution's future. This means, of course, offering um, top quality journalism, and this is a job of our great journalists and reporters. On the other side, this needs to be complemented with uh, also a bit of a business mind that can build models, uh, partnerships, new ideas that, of course, um, can, um, you know, uh, encapsulate that great journalism and deliver it to the right audiences. And uh, that is where, like, I found my own niche, is trying to be innovative in the journalism field through uh, business. And um, I had the great opportunity to do this at the beginning of my career. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. <laughs> no, it's great that you found your niche and, and it's interesting the way you found it. So I know the famous story that you wrote to John Slade, the chief commercial officer at Financial Times. So do you just want to tell our listeners about how you wrote to him, what kind of response you got from John Slade, and how did that turn into a role of a business development manager? 
Of course, of course. So um, I love that you said the famous story <laughs> because <laughs> it's just, you know, this is something I love to say just, uh, you know, to make people understand a bubble, you know, younger, um, very passionate people around our industry about the way to access our industry and not to have the preconception or, you know, even like, you know, starting with the assumption that journalism and the news is a kind of very elitist uh, business. And so it's very difficult to get in. There are a lot of leaders as John. I wrote to him on LinkedIn when I was writing my dissertation, asking him if I could have his insights as a chief commercial officer on the business model of FT, because this was the topic of my dissertation. And he didn't just say yes to that. First of all, he answered to the, to the LinkedIn message that is not quite obvious, as I think you know, Trisha, <laughs> from uh, very busy people and they can be as, uh, as board members can be. <laughs> but then uh, Secondly, is also um, it was so nice to welcome me to the FT office, and it wasn't just you know a cold uh, uh, call over the phone and just you know ask me the ten question, ten minutes. Thank you very much. Goodbye. But it was a bit more of a very interactive session where I had the time to explain to him what I've been doing, and he's like you know he wanted to know me as a person and why I was so curious about the FT. And uh, I don't want to say too much about even like what I'm trying to do, but I'm really trying to give back this uh, uh, this moment I had because basically something I'm really trying to do to anyone that now you know I'm in a kind of not privilege but you know I'm in a position of like working at the FT so I want to give it back and having the same, same attitude with anyone that is writing to me or asking me questions or like uh, even you know I'm trying really to meet anyone that wants to know a bit more about the FT because I think building a sustainable business in the area of journalism means involving uh, younger people, not just from a reader side point of view, but also giving an overview of our ecosystem, as you were, as we were saying, right, um, mm -hmm. to a bit uh, change a kind of mindset that is like, oh, journalism, or I can do it only if I want to be a reporter, a writer, or whatever. While you know, it's also, of course, is that, but then there is so much more. There are designers, uh, product developers. Uh, business developers is a whole like very uh, like big um, world uh, that really covers very different areas and it's important that we make that clear maybe you know uh, maybe doing uh, you know what I kind I like to say our one-on-one -on -one, uh, coffee meetings and mm -hmm. I think you know it's not just through meeting me or one of my colleagues but you know if all of us have this attitude we will definitely, I think, attract greater talent out there. No, I think this kind of attitude is what attracts students like me and others to reach out. And I think you're doing a great job. That's exactly my goal with the help of this podcast is to take the expertise of people like you and share it to the students who are out there trying to enter the world. But let's take a step back and talk about your startups. Mm -hmm. Do you want to briefly mention those startups, but also talk about how finding those startups has helped you become the youngest developing manager at Financial Times. When I was 17, I founded Visa Art Magazine that then turned into a cultural foundation in, in, in back to Italy. It was just a university paper, but the dream there was, I want to use Visa Magazine as the pillar of a bigger foundation. So having that like five or 10 years longer term mindset is really key when you are a startup, I believe. But then having that lean approach is like, okay, I start by myself and then we are five people. I test the idea. So testing is really important. Test the idea. And then what you can do is like, okay, can I involve more people? What are the kind of products I can deliver? At the beginning, no, no diversification. Implementation is important on one, two things. Make that one, two things work very well and then diversify what you do. After that, what you can do is definitely saying, okay, what else, what, what else do I want out of this brand? Because when you're building a startup, it's not just one product, it's a brand. That is really what an entrepreneur needs to embrace. It's the brand and the values, the missions, what you're representing with that idea. 
And throughout the implementation, you are definitely going to show that. At the end, this is basically a kind of journey that taught me, first of all, how important it is to test and um, how important it is to coordinate different people, how important it is to manage different personalities in different teams, and uh, how important it is to have a 360 degrees overview of a project and have a long-term approach. Otherwise, you're just a manager. Manager is very good in making a small task project happen, but the kind of short, medium-term vision, it's what, because you, know, you need to have a very um, short result, kind of a very short KPIs. When you're an entrepreneur, you look, you look at the longer term and not what you can achieve as you as a person with that idea, but how do you make that shared within the group you are funding the, the idea? So being an entrepreneur is not just, the, oh, you're an entrepreneur if you have a startup that made X million and you sold it. I think being an entrepreneur is an attitude you have even when you're working in a company. So how I like to place myself, um, maybe a bit arrogantly here, is that I love to say that I try to see my job as being an entrepreneur. So it's kind of entrepreneurs that work inside of companies. So that's why entrepreneurs. And from the definition of, you know, the founder of the concept is like dreamers who do. So entrepreneurs are people that have this attitude of like, uh, treating the company they are working for as their own company. That's why it's really powerful to have uh, an innov innov innovative mindset when you're approaching any role in your career. But I think at the beginning of your career, it's really, really key. I completely agree with you when you say that implementation is so important. And that brings me to my next question. How does a day of a business developer look like? And by that, I mean, what amount of your time goes into research but what amount of your time also goes into execution and implementation? Sure. So I think this connects quite well with the past question. So good one, Trisha. How much time, you were saying about the research, how much time actually I would add there, you need to invest in understanding the needs of all the different stakeholders in the organization. Are they, are, are they gonna buy the idea? That's the first big question we need to answer. And um, how many problems are you solving for them? And um, if it's, uh, you know, all please go ahead, how much time I invested, not in just in the research of the product, but or the program or project, we need to be audience focused. We need to be users focused, meaning how much important is this new project for my new audiences out there? or current audiences, meaning you need to look at this, I think not just in the news ecosystem and not just in my job uh, for like, you know, in the, in the world of uh, FT, meaning uh, business development, if you do business development, but it's very different, again, I'm gonna say this uh, from sales, it's so much more about trying to build from zero, from scratch, new ideas that are going to work in the long run and then are going to become business as usual and are not part of my business anymore. Meaning the business developer, what you need to do is test the new stuff, make them work for one, two, three years, and then pass them to another department because then it can become business as usual and you can think about a new thing. So. This approach, definitely research is a lot of time, but is even internal research. And then look at the customers. So it means uh, it's not just a marketing research, uh, get in touch with your potential customers. So it means like surveys, it means like direct interviews, you know, it's like uh, having a direct contact and be data driven in your solution. So I need to demonstrate uh, scientifically that my idea makes sense. Data from marketing uh, customers perspective, but also from a business perspective, never forget that. And of course, then all the rest is implementation. But the first bit of idea, 
oh my God, that one is <laughs> super important because if it doesn't make any sense from a business perspective, a data perspective, a user's perspective, you're just losing all your time on implementation. So there are times you need to kill some ideas, definitely. And you might not realize it even when you're doing the research. You can realize that only when you start presenting, pitching the idea internally, and you start getting a few feedbacks from stakeholders, but not so much more than you. No, I think you did a good job explaining the difference between business development and sales. I think that is very important. But now I wanted to talk to you about the task of convincing people of your ideas. That is something you mentioned in your answer as well. I believe it is super hard to convince an entire group of people of your idea. So have you ever faced this challenge in your career? I think it's like, it's not really just my team. To be honest, I, I am so lucky to work in a very small team. And what is beautiful about being in such a small city <laughs> as our team is that you know <clears throat> i can have a direct contact with my boss and uh, he is a very blunty like you know he's such a very honest person and he's gonna say like look i'm gonna say this to you i think this is gonna be a no or this is gonna be a yes for x y z the reasons but he's always been very happy to help me to try to structure the idea because i think it's also you know my team it's a bit of a blue sky team sometimes i think we are there to give a bit that sense of new fresh air coming in into a meeting sometimes like oh you know you want to take this a bit further that's the kind of idea i if if we were you we would be doing this is a kind of i don't want to say internal consultants because i don't want us to be associated with consultants um because consultants do a very different job however i think it's really important that you uh, you try to understand maybe when it comes when you have access to numbers because they are public, for example, of like our budgets or like what are our targets. It's like, okay, so if I'm presenting this idea to the marketing director or the B2B uh, chief uh, and director, what are the targets for this person? And how I'm gonna show this director that my idea can help him or her. This is really mm -hmm. important. And it's not just, you know, it's not because you want to be sneaky, it's that you want just to think, actually talk in the same language of the other person. Of course, I think my strategy is not doing that at the beginning. I think being a bit more, you know, open and honest about the idea and uh, what is uh, generally the, I mean, always welcome other people's questions. And then when they start questioning you on the idea, try to have the right answers in their language, but not doing it first because otherwise, you know, you are, mm, you are never a well-defined, uh, structured thinker. You're always someone that mm -hmm. puts put masks on, you know? Okay, so if I'm speaking to the marketing manager, I'm gonna be um, in the marketing, uh, you know, presenting media in marketing language. No, don't do it at the beginning, do it as a business developer. And then when you're gonna answer the questions or, you know, uh, building uh, up, on the details that you receive, um, use their language. And this is something I've, uh, I've, um, I've learned from my boss at the FG. Mm -hmm. He's very good yeah. at this. Moving ahead, something you had mentioned in your previous answer was in regards to realizing midway that an idea or project is not feasible. What should a business developer's plan of action be in such cases? Should they let go of the idea or should they go back work on the feedback and try to solve the problem. You know, I'm a bit of a senti like a sentimental person, so I never let go ideas if I think the ideas were right, meaning maybe I need to twist the idea, I need to wait for it. For example, now I'm working on a project that I think is going to receive a no, but I'm still very convinced that the idea is, is actually a good one and uh, would have very nice effects for our business. However, maybe there are, you know, a few problems or a few questions that needs to be solved before. Uh, and this, it's instrumental, this new idea is instrumental for us to know which are the problems we need to solve that we already have before having a new idea that would be another problem, but you're not resolving the one here, in the base of you know, your organization, you want to be able to deliver nicely the, fir the, the first idea you had. So if, I'm, if you see what, what I mean here, it's basically being structured in the way you think 
the idea, but also in the way you think about the failure of your idea. So trying to understand, okay, this didn't work because I didn't have X resources. So it's a problem of, you know, talent, is a talent problem or it's just, you know, time commitment. There are not enough people that can uh, take the time to do this. So it's, uh, you know, bad timing because it's, uh, you know, in the middle of COVID times or thinking about the feedback. I think the feedback is really, really key. And uh, I think don't being afraid of asking a bit more of like feedback from the people that are gonna say no to the idea that most of the time, you know, are like the senior stakeholders, like why is this not working? And if you do not agree, try to build a bit more your knowledge, not with arrogance, of course, but it's like, I want to try to understand what is not working here. So the next idea I'll present, it makes us, it doesn't incur in the same problem. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And you said that you're a sentimental person, you're passionate towards your ideas. And that makes me think, how important is it to be passionate towards the idea that you're developing? Because a lot of times you can receive ideas that are great and will be amazing for the business, but you're not passionate about them. So should you still go ahead with those ideas or... How important is it to be passionate about your ideas? I think it's quite important because it gives you a reason to wake up, right? If you're way, if you are like just going to work and deliver a great project, but you you don't really like it, I think you're not gonna last a lot in the business. Or generally, you're not gonna last a lot in that company because you don't see a meaning behind it. So if you don't see a very clear reason why. Uh, you should be passionate about the idea, try to understand how the idea fits in the ecosystem and why it's so successful. I think uh, it won't be possible not to be passionate about something that you know is so beneficial for the business. However, we all know that maybe sometimes when we do data, Excel sheets or whatever, it's not the most entertaining thing in the world. But maybe, you know, when you know there is a meaning behind it, it makes, you know, it makes it a bit nicer <laughs> and it's like uh, i think it's just you know it's not just a motivational technique tactic, you know tactic here but i think it's uh, if it's beneficial for a business and you're passionate about the business you're working for and with and in uh, it's just it's a, you you want to see the problem i think it's really important to be passionate about your job i mean i'm not saying that every time everyone i'm seeing around is like oh my god i love my job you know you know i mean very very good days and bad days but at least I think a fundamental feeling of like, you know, I'm in the right place doing the right job. But here I just want to tell you something. My first, first ever job at the FT, of course, didn't start as a business development manager, of course. So I was working when I arrived at the FT as a junior program uh, project manager and uh, project coordinator, basically. And it was an admin job. It means I needed, uh, I needed to do from a booking flights, booking catering. It's like, you know, it can be interesting, but until a certain point. Meaning uh, that that role, however, it was, I couldn't be passionate about the role, of course. But was a, what I, I saw the value in that is that for the 13 months I've been working in that ecosystem, I could learn so much about the FT. I completely agree with you when you say it's important to be passionate because the fact that I was so passionate about this podcast, I was able to turn it around within two months. But I think an other thing that is super important in business development is creativity, which you already mentioned in the start. So I wanted to understand how can one develop and build this creativity because it does not come that easily. Okay, so I think um, creativity is a definitely, um, and uh, again, it's it can be an attitude as well, like, you know, um, looking uh, um, to the into the ecosystem and not just to the one idea and being over-specified around it. However, even when you're very specific about a solution, you can be creative in, in offering something new. So I think keyword here would be contamination. If you want to be creative, you need to, I believe, read a lot and be exposed to a lot of stuff that are not just within your industry. I think it's really important that when we look at news and media, we just don't look at content 
and what is all around the content, but, or, you know, can be marketing the data within the news ecosystem. It's really important to look at other industries, other worlds and what other companies are doing. So contamination, meaning don't look just at your direct competitors, you know, and uh, being creative is a job you can do by yourself. Being creative means to me being exposed and to be exposed, I think you need to be curious. So if there is one thing you need to have or deliberately being looking for is uh, your curiosity. And your curiosity, you can show it in many different ways. I think one of the easiest ones is uh, to just explore topics, not just through an Instagram feed, but of course it can be, you know, uh, Instagram sometimes offers like great content and, you know, I know so many new things through Instagram, but, you know, it's not just that, just uh, read a book, read something completely different, listen to a podcast, <laughs> uh, watch a um, documentary or uh, um, a series that might interest you, but I think don't be monothematic, don't look at just one field and be over over vertical there otherwise we tend then to uh, uh, being a bit uh, engineers of our own fields that is great i think you you need to be specific in your solutions and you need to know always more and more about one field and you want to be an expert there however i think experts are also curious and the experts need to uh, be open to contamination with the different fields if they want to be creative as well that was super insightful. That was super insi insightful. And the reason behind that is because now I have a clear idea how you came up with one of your cre most creative ideas that is financial talent <laughs> challenge. So do you want to talk about this creative idea of yours, the financial talent challenge, how you came up with it and why is it so important to you? Uh, no, definitely. I think that's, uh, I think it's a creative solution to um, kind of issues, questions we had as FT. I mean, uh, one is a brand awareness problem. It's like, do students and younger talents do really know what the FT is doing? And what are we working for? And what are our values? Second one is a brand perception problem, very different. Like, is it, are we really sure that the way we perceive ourselves as FT is the same the way a younger student in uh, Spain is perceiving the FT that he's, he's, he is receiving for free. And it would be the same for uh, a lady in the US that is reading uh, the FT through her B2B subscription. I think there was a gap there. And um, then the further thing is being diversity and inclusion, meaning diverse talent. Do we get the best talent out there? And the best talent out there, is it really diverse? and representative of the international global voice we want to represent. Of course, I think this is our like, you know, all uh, million dollar questions. And so, you know, I don't have an answer really, but definitely something that started small, again, here, the lean approach, just a very small target, small test, test it on 50 people and then expand it. That's how we started in 2018, um, FT Talent Challenge, just bring, together students from all over the world, 50 of them, and make them talk to FT employees. Not just talk, but also build ideas. And um, this would have been a great brand awareness perception game-changing moment. But also, what about the diversity of the ideas we received as FT? And all the you know, moderators and mentors that were involved they really got contaminated by the new the ideas with you know these young strangers, but readers or even not readers of FT delivered for them and with them. It all started as um, FT only and based on the future of news. Now that we saw that the model works, it makes sense. So you remember the test part. Now we are expanding it and involving way more actors and stakeholders. At the beginning, start small, make it successful for a small group of people, deliver something meaningful for the people taking part into the project, the participants. So of course we hire out of it. Just to sum it up, 
I think it's really imp- what it shows FT talent is like uh, being contaminated and uh, knowing I've been reading a lot and even took part to a lot of other hackathons and challenges around the world before building my own one. I'm not saying here that I copy and pasted stuff, but of course I got inspired by some things and then I said, oh, this is a, the FT spin. This is the way the FT should be doing it. It's like, I see the model. Okay, let's do it in this way. And this is where the creativity comes out. I think FTX challenge answers all the million dollar questions you asked yourself. So congrats on that. And to all the listeners who want to check out FTX challenge, go ahead. The applications are now live, so you can definitely go ahead and apply. But if you have seen my first and the second podcast, you would know my traditional last question. That is, what is one advice you wish you had received when you were starting your career as a business developer? Mm -hmm. Definitely something I, I want to say here is that uh, when I was an intern during my studies at uh, LSE for another company, but I'm not going to say here, um, one of the top managers told me, you will never, and I was so worried about this feedback, uh, you will never be able to work in a news and media organization because of uh, your language. And it was like just a very honest, even brutally honest, but it's like, you know, uh, from his point of view, it's like, you know, you need to do, and basically you need to be able to understand, in this case, English, you know, in all the different um, uh, colors, shadows to do this job. I think there is always room for improvement, but that feedback that was quite instrumental for me. So, you know, I started like uh, reading, listening, doing anything, everything I could in English. And I'm still, you know, there is still so much to improve. I'm, I'm too proudly Itali- Italian not to forget about <laughs> my accent. I do not think should have influenced me so much because diversity is beautiful. And sometimes being very honest and saying to your colleague, even, you know, the CEO, like, sorry, would you mind repeating? Or like, can you repeat what you said? It was like, sorry, I didn't get what you mean by that. I think it doesn't show that we are vulnerable, all this poetic thing about being vulnerable. No, I think it just shows us that we are humans and, you know, we bring our own diversities. We bring our own cultures. And I think that's the beauty of it, you know? It's like, you might pronounce stuff a bit differently from me, but we are, you know, speaking the same language. We are understanding each other. But I wish someone said that to me when I I said to colleagues or friends, you know, I received this feedback, is my English so bad? And, you know, start getting very frustrated about it. (laughs) However, um, that's why, that's what I would suggest myself, your diversity, uh, your backgrounds, people's backgrounds. Uh, this is the beauty of working in a place like London or, you know, virtual rooms as this one we built today together. And um, that's beautiful. So mm. don't be influenced by that. <laughs> well, don't let language be a barrier for your dream career and always take feedback in the most positive way possible. And other than that, if you're a business developer, Test your processes, work on it, and then expand. On that note, thank you so much, Virginia, for your time today. Thank you for sharing the journey of your job. It's been my pleasure to have you on today. Oh, thank you so much, Trishan, for having me. I think it's been great. And the congratulations on this new adventure of yours. Join me next week to discuss the journey of a data scientist and analyst. Until then, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn for some exciting content throughout the week.